those that are watching my live stream or maybe later or recorded, we're uh, in the Kane Harvey. If you're holed up somewhere, we want to pray for you. You know, these storms, they're not of God. A storm is defined as a disturbance in the air. And who is the prince of the power of the air? The Spanish word for storm is tormenta. Who is the tormentor? God, you know, Jesus, we can read in the word where he calmed the storm. Well, he doesn't create a storm and then calm it, just like he doesn't make you sick and then heal you. Amen. So we're coming against that thing and we're going to have to use faith words because there's a whole lot of people out there talking fear words. That's what makes these things linger in everything so long. But faith words override fear words. Praise the Lord. So let's pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we come against Hurricane Harvey. We command it to die in Jesus' name. And we just pray a hedge of protection around those uh, that uh, have water. And but Lord, we just, we just declare and decree in Jesus' name that any standing water will recede immediately, straight away, from this very hour in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord, for... Uh, just guiding me by your spirit in Jesus name. Amen. And amen. amen. We want to talk about expecting to receive. It's particularly in relation to when you give, praise the Lord. A lot of people uh, don't receive because they're expecting God to do it their way, to do it how they think it should be done. Of course, God's way is always better. So it's going to be different. And then when it comes, they don't recognize it. They don't lay hold of it and it passes them by. Now, some people don't receive because they're not expecting anything. They just think, well, you give and you just give because you love God and you don't expect anything in return. We're going to see what the word of God has to say about that. You see, because the, word, the uh, world system is based on taking from others to get increase or to gain increase. But the kingdom of God is based on giving to others and then you being increased, praise the Lord, as you receive the harvest with the increase. So we have to expect to receive when we give because what we believe is where we end up or is it in Proverbs 23, 7, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if you're thinking in your heart, I'm not going to receive, I just give and go out, then you're not going to. So we got the way that you think in your heart, praise the Lord, because God wants his people to know he's for them, not against them. They're going to need to receive in order to do everything he's put in his heart, their hearts to do that they might fulfill their kingdom destiny. So we have to get into the right mentality that God has for us, particularly in this area of expecting to receive when we give. And the best way to accomplish this is to study the parable of the unjust steward in Luke chapter 16. He said also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, how is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship for thou mayest no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot, I cannot dig to beg I am ashamed. I'm resolved what to do that when I put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, how much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. He said unto him, take that bill, sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much owest thou? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, take that bill and write four score. So here is this steward giving away the rich man's goods, so he'd have a place to go when he gets fired. Isn't that what it said? 
It's exactly what he said. So in our human reasoning, we would think, boy, I can't wait to see that verse eight. I can't wait to see how the rich man is going to sock it to him. And he's going to say, you no good, low down, good for nothing. Sorry, steward, giving away piles of my money to those lousy bunch of debtors who will never be able to pay me what they owe just so you'll have a place to go when you get fired. You are fired, take your belongings, and never come back. I can't wait to see how he socks it to him. Let's look at verse 8 and see what it says. What? And the Lord commended the unjust steward, for he had done wisely. Have you ever experienced cognitive dissonance? You know, one thing is true and another. I'm kind of feeling that right now. What? What? We better go on to the next part of it because maybe that'll make more sense. For the children of this world, that's the lost people, are in their generation wiser than the children of light, God's people. What? What is God? Cuckoo, cuckoo. What is going on here? How many of you would like to know what's going on? Amen. And understand the principle and how it uh, flows right into the whole counsel of God. And that if you get a hold of it, it'll cause rejoicing and that you'll be exceedingly glad and you'll live your life better than you've ever lived it before for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Well, let's get started. I got to lay a little bit more, but hold on with me. There's a kick at the end. And so let's talk about it. The unjust steward gave away <clears throat> what belonged to the rich man so that when, not if, but when he were put out of the stewardship, he had a place to go. They said they'd receive me into their houses. He definitely gave to get. Isn't that right? Amen. The steward knew a principle, praise the Lord. He knew that what he gave away would come back to him to secure his personal future. Do you know that's the same for you? You can have a secure future. My future is secure based on not what I've got in the bank, etc., etc., but based on what I give away today. If I keep giving, I guarantee I will keep receiving. And that receiving is going to have increase in it, praise the Lord. But the rich man also knew this principle. The rich man had a lot of wisdom. That's why he's so rich. Amen. He was pleased with the steward because the steward knew how to be a success in life and bless the rich man in the process. That's the kind of steward that he wanted. He not only kept the steward on the job and didn't fire him, he probably gave him a raise. He said he's done wi uh, wisely. And if he's wiser, then he's worth more money. So not only did not he didn't fire him, probably gave him a raise. Why would Jesus say that the lost are wiser than his children? Remember now, he said, in their generation. In their generation, the world understood giving to get better than God's people. They understood the concept. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. They understood, let's work together. Even if they used this principle for evil, like they did in the Tower of Babel. But in, and I declare and decree in Jesus' name, in this current generation that will lead us into the end time wealth transfer and end time transfer of souls into the kingdom of God, God's people Right now, we are surpassing the world in the use of this powerful kingdom principle of giving in order to receive. Praise the Lord. The steward gave while expecting to receive. Jesus told his disciples that the rich man commended him and that he had done wisely. He was wise because he gave, believing that when he gave, it was going to come back to him and salvage his future. Who is the rich man in this parable? Who is the one that let the steward know that he would be called into account of his stewardship? He said also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward and the same was accused of him 
that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said, how is it I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship for thou mayest no longer be steward. God the Father is the rich, the rich man represents God the Father and Adam is the steward. Adam was God's steward over the earth. God and Adam visited fellowship daily, every day. Adam gave an account of, uh, of himself each day. The earth belonged to God, but Adam was in charge of it. He had the stewardship. And even after Adam messed up, God came calling for his daily visit. Let's look at Genesis 3, 8 through 11. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Adam lost his fellowship through sin. God called him to give an account of his stewardship and he had no answer. He said, I can't dig to beg, I am ashamed. He had no answer. There was nothing that Adam can do to redeem himself. God still loved Adam and wanted his fellowship. But could God fellowship with him the way that he was? No. Adam couldn't fix the problem at all. So if God wanted our fellowship, God had to do something. Adam had no answer, so God himself revealed the answer. Luke 16, 4, we'll read it again. I am resolved what to do, that when I'm put out of the stewardship, they may receive me unto their houses. Not only had God lost fellowship with man, now man was fellowshipping with God's arch enemy. Think of how that must hurt the heart of God. So God began to show man that there was only one way to restore fellowship and reconcile God and man. Man had to see that all other methods fail. So God sent the law. Did the law reconcile God and man? No, it just revealed man's sin and put him farther away from God. So he sent prophets. Did prophets reconcile God and man? No, we just stoned them. The people said, we want kings. God says, okay, I'll give you kings. Did kings reconcile God and man? No, they just taxed the people and put burdens on them. How about the priests? Oh, maybe this is it. God sent priests. Did that reconcile God and man? No, the Bible says it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats could redeem men from their sin. So when the fullness of time came, the appointed time, the Kairos time, the father did what he knew he would do from the foundation of the world. He took his best. He wanted the best and the greatest harvest of all time. So he took his greatest and his best, his word, and put the word in the form of what he wanted to receive, a man. Because he knew in the earth, he put the principle whatsoever of what you sow, that is what you're going to reap. He wanted more men. He wanted more women. And so he put his word in the form of a man because that's what he wanted to receive. And he sowed him as a seed into the ground as Jesus prophesied, John 12, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. He had Jesus. He was the only son. He was abiding alone up there. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. It was sown as a seed. When the father sowed Jesus, he didn't want just Jesus back. He sowed him to get us, praise the Lord. We are the increase. Amen. And the kind of harvest you want determines the kind of seed that you sow. The father must have had great confidence in the principle he put in the earth. What you sow, you reap with increase in order to give his only begotten son over to that. Let's examine the greatest gift that's ever been given. John 3.16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Love motivated God to give, but he also gave for a desired result. The Father gave Jesus so that he could have us. Praise the Lord. The Father gave expecting to receive what he had sowed with increase. Praise the Lord. He gave so that we would have everlasting life. Love is his motive. Giving is his method. And that's how we should live on the earth too. God knew to get what he wanted, he had to sow a seed. And we should know the same thing. And the love that motivated God produced or worked the faith to believe the so that part, the desired result. Galatians 5, 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Love motivating you to give, then works the faith so you can give so that and receive the increase. So if giving in order to receive is wrong, then God Almighty was wrong because that's what he did. What about the person that says, well, I just want to give out of love and I expect nothing back. I just want to please God. Well, where's the faith in that? And without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's not a choice of love or receiving. It's both or nothing because faith works by love. Did God's seed work? Amen. On the third day, his seed sprouted. Praise the Lord. And there's not anything that anyone can do to stop a seed sown unto the Lord because it has resurrection power in it. No matter what kind of seed. They put the big two-ton rock. They put the, the most experienced, burliest, uh, meanest soldiers. Put Pilate's seal on it. The biggest name in the territory. If they couldn't stop the resurrection power of God. And they, the devil can't stop it today when you sow a seed. Man. The father sowed a seed in faith. Believed when he did, he would receive a harvest with increase. He must have believed in his system. And let's get back to that answer of this mind-boggling question. That he commended him and said, you've done wisely. You see what happened? Jesus replaced Adam as the unjust steward. Adam was there. He didn't know what to do. He had no answer. I can't dig. To beg, I'm ashamed. Then Jesus became the unjust steward. He knew exactly what to do. Why? Why was it wise? Why did the Father commend him? Because Jesus said, I only do what my Father tells me to do. Praise the Lord. He knew what Adam didn't know what to do, but Jesus did. And the Father was well pleased. Adam, through sin, became the unjust steward. He started out, he was a good steward. Then through sin, he became an unjust steward. And God came, hey, Adam, give an account. And there wasn't anything he could do. Jesus took his place as the second and last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ, all will be made alive. Hallelujah. Then 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 47. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Living spirit, how be it that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Jesus literally became the unjust steward, praise the Lord. And he was still called the unjust steward when he gave away the rich man's goods, when he gave away all the good things that belong to the father. Jesus, who was without sin, literally became the unjust steward for you and for me by taking on the sins of the world. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus became the unjust steward 
And as the unjust steward, he was resolved what to do. He knew exactly what to do. He and his father were one. And he went around and he gave various discounts to all the, uh, the rich man's debtors. Some of us needed bigger discounts than others, amen? But there's none of us that could pay what was owed. He gave away the rich man's good. That's what Jesus did. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to give away the rich man's good. He gave sight to the blind. He gave hearing to the deaf. He gave speech to the dumb. Praise the Lord. He gave health to those that were sick. He gave courage to the discouraged. He gave the ability to walk to those with lame feet. He gave and he gave. Just like Acts 10, 38, he went about doing good and healing all who oppressed of the devil, gave away all the goodness and blessing of his father to us lousy debtors, praise the Lord, just out of love. And it worked. We love him because he first loved us, amen. And his father commended him when he was being baptized in the river Jordan. And the spirit of the Lord was coming down like a very beautifully, like a beautiful dove. The voice of the father was heard saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I'm not firing him. I'm not mad at him for giving away all my goodness and giving away discounts to all those debtors who can never pay their bill. Praise the Lord. I'm giving him a raise. Hallelujah. I'm keeping him on the job. Let's look at Matthew 17, 5. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son who I love. With him, I'm well pleased. Listen to him. I commend him. He has done wisely. Praise the Lord. Jesus, as the unjust steward, called every one of the rich man's debtors because no one could pay what was owed. Are we not all debtors? Haven't we all sinned, fall short of the glory of God? Thank God, Jesus understands and the Father approves of giving while expecting to receive. Praise the Lord. The Father didn't fire Jesus. He gave him a raise. He gave him the greatest raise that has ever been given or ever will be given. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let this, see, this is what we're doing today. We're going to let this mind that was in Christ Jesus be in you. I declare in Jesus' name that this message will not just go into your mind first, but in Jesus' name it will go into your spirit, into the spirit man yoked with the spirit of God and the spirit man. I declare it takes dominion over the soul man and will impart by the spirit of God the message in Jesus' name such that it will never leave and that you'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let this mind, just go ahead and let it. Amen. God wants to give it to you right now. Just receive it. Let this thinking go in, but let it go through your spirit first, into your, then into your mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, he became the unjust steward. He went from God to the place of there wasn't anything made that he didn't make into the sin, the unjust steward, took upon him the form of a servant and was made in likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God gave him the greatest raise that's ever been given. Hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven things in the earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father I'm not firing him I'm giving him a raise I'm well pleased praise the Lord it's the same for us you know in the kingdom when you invest, you expect to receive. But you see, if we want to be exalted by God, what do we do? We do the same thing that our example, Jesus. He's our example in everything on how to live on this earth. It's not robbery for us to say we're joint heirs with Jesus. Because we are. Just like it wasn't robbery for Jesus to say I'm God. 
but yet he still humbled himself. Even though we're joint heirs with Jesus, we've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. What do we do? We humble ourselves and take on the form of a servant and become obedient even to the point of death on a cross. Now, we don't take on other people's sins like Jesus, but what is, what is our cross? When Jesus said, pick up your cross, follow me. A cross is a place where flesh is crucified. We become a servant and we obey God by, as we crucify our flesh to put him in charge and let it come through our spirit man, which has dominion over our soul, our mind, emotions, will, imagination, which then has dominion over our body. And when we do that and serve God like that, he will exalt us and make it when we use the name of Jesus, the demons will be subject to us because God has exalted us as we have humbled ourselves before God. Hallelujah. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Praise God. So in the kingdom, it is not considered wrong or ungodly but to give with receiving in mind. It's not considered ungodly, but it's something that pleases God and results from godly wisdom. Uh, Luke 16, 8. The Lord commended him and said, you have done wisely. That could be you. That could be me. We give expecting to receive, believing what the Word of God says the Lord will say about you. You've done, I commend you. You have done wisely. You know, you remind me of my son, Jesus. That's exactly what he did, praise the Lord. And so it blesses the Father when we do that. And we get blessed. He gets blessed, and then others around us gets blessed because when you give, you, even though you do it as unto the Lord, it goes to a man. Have you noticed that? There's not a big, like, offering bucket that comes down from heaven that, you know, God's hand has it, and, and you stick your uh, money in there, and, and then God takes it up to heaven. No, you give to a man, and then it comes back to you from a man. Good measure, press down, shake together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. Amen? Yeah. Amen. And, and by the way, those big hands don't come down and heal people either. Believers lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Amen. So that could be you and I. We could be having our heavenly father commend us and say, I see how he gives with receiving in mind. He expects it to come back with increase just like what I want because he has the mind that's in Christ Jesus. And therefore, I think I'm going to give him a raise, praise the Lord, or give her a raise that you'll have power, dunamis power, not just have it, but I mean manifested power. And the things of this world and the world system and the demons and all those that would be contrary to the word of God, they have to be subject when you speak, to you when you speak the name of Jesus, because God will highly exalt you. Aren't you glad that Jesus became the unjust steward and he knew exactly what to do? I'm going to give away my father's blessings and goodness and it's going to uh, provide. You know, here's, think about this. Jesus said, he became the unjust steward. He said, I'm resolved what to do. Oh, Adam didn't know. He said, oh, I can't, I can't dig to beg. I'm ashamed. In other words, there was no answer. Jesus said, I'll give away my father's goods and they'll receive me into their houses. Where does Jesus live on the earth today? You know, you got the Holy Ghost moving around, but we house Jesus on the earth. And he did that and now he has this habitation in you and I, just like he said that he would. Praise the Lord. So I want to pray for you. And then the Pastor Daniel's going to come. And it's all good. Amen. That stuff out there can't do anything to us. Praise God. I just take dominion over it in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for revelation of your word by the Spirit. I thank you in Jesus' name that the people received it right into their spirit. Deep calling unto deep to receive it 
and that our minds are now renewed and we're transformed more in your likeness. And we'll live like you and you will compliment us and commend us and we'll keep getting wiser and wiser and wiser. And I declare in Jesus' name that all those that hear this today or in the future, that they shall fulfill their kingdom destiny in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for it. We thank you for your principles, how they always work for our good. And we bless you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Oh.